Buckle those overalls, kids, because 5.6 is a doozy, let me tell you. In fact, there's going to be so much going on in this video and so much information on the screen that I need to make my face disappear off of the screen so that you can see everything on each of the slides. So uh, please excuse me while I disappear magically in a flock of dubs. <sighs> Now today we're going to be talking about these essential questions. <clears throat> we will discuss what a codon is. We'll talk about all the steps of the protein synthesis process. We will go through all the different molecules and organelles involved in protein synthesis. And by the end of this, you'll be able to take any sequence of DNA, such as the one below, and transcribe it into a sequence of RNA and then translate it into a sequence of protein. Man, that's a lot. Remember when I told you to buckle on your overalls? Maybe I should have told you to put a diaper on first. All right, so remember that DNA is mainly serving the function of being instructions for proteins within cells. That's why we have DNA, and that's how DNA ultimately determines who we are and what we do and how we develop. Now, DNA is broken up into a bunch of pieces, and each piece is broken up into sections. A section of DNA is called a gene, and a, a gene is a set of instructions for a particular protein. So when a gene is read and utilized as instructions for making a protein, we call that process gene expression because it's a gene whose message is getting expressed. But by doing so, it's making a protein. So sometimes we also call this process protein synthesis because proteins are what are being made. So gene expression and protein synthesis are synonyms. They mean the same thing. Before we talk about protein synthesis, though, kind of have to remember that DNA is stored in this special organelle called the nucleus in the middle of the cell, or maybe not in the middle of the cell, but within the cell. And... I also want to note that prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, so this does not apply to prokaryotes, but eukaryotes, such as humans and all other animals and plants, they have a nucleus. So we are talking about specifically gene expression in eukaryotes in this lecture. DNA is stored in the nucleus, but proteins are made out here in the cytoplasm, in this liquidy gooey part of the cell. So somehow, the instructions in the DNA have to make their way out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm so that proteins can be made there. But the thing is, the DNA can't leave the nucleus. So how do you get the instructions out of the nucleus if they're stuck in the nucleus? Well, we're going to need something else to carry the message for us. And that, you might remember, is mRNA. The little m at the beginning of mRNA actually stands for messenger. What mRNA is, is it's basically a copy of a gene from a DNA molecule that gets made and then sent out of the nucleus to carry that message to a ribosome in the cytoplasm of the cell to make a protein. Now this process of gene expression or protein synthesis is broken, on in, broken down into two parts. The first is called transcription and the second is called translation. So we'll start with transcription first, which is the making of mRNA molecules from a DNA molecule. There's three essentially parts to this first part. So there's three subparts. Um, first, the thing that has to happen is that the DNA strand has to be unwound. Now think about it. DNA is a double helix. It's two strands stuck together in the middle. And where the strands are stuck together is between the nitrogenous bases. And the nitrogenous bases are the actual genetic code component of the DNA. So that's where the information is. So basically, when it's all wound up, the information is like stuck in the middle here and can't really be read by anything. So the first thing that a cell has to do is it has to unwind a little section of the DNA molecule. Um, it has to unwind the gene that it wants to read. Then step two is it's going to read that gene and make RNA from it. It's going to do that by sending an RNA polymerase in that will make a complementary mRNA strand that's complementary to one of the sides of the DNA molecule. This might sound familiar, and it is familiar because 
making mRNA or making any type of RNA is really similar to DNA replication, which you learned about last week. The only difference is that in RNA transcription, instead of a DNA polymerase, it's an RNA polymerase that is doing the replicating. And instead of putting thymines in, uracils will go in across from each adenine. You can see here in the DNA, wherever there's an adenine, there's a uracil across from it in the growing mRNA strand. Also, it's not really shown in the image, but the sugar in this backbone that's being built is ribose sugar, not deoxyribose, because that's the sugar that's in RNA. But otherwise, the process of making RNA versus making DNA is pretty much exactly the same. The polymerase is going to go through and it's going to match up each base with a complementary base in the strand that it's growing. Once an, RN, once an entire gene has been transcribed in this way, the third step is that the mRNA is going to disconnect and it's going to go off and do its thing and the DNA is going to rewind. So that's pretty important. After this transcription event takes place, the DNA basically just reforms the double helix and winds back up and it's as if nothing ever happened. The DNA looks exactly like it did before except that now you have a copy of a part of it as an mRNA strand. So you've done this before for DNA replication, but we're going to do this now for RNA transcription. If you can imagine that this sequence of letters is the nucleotide code in a DNA sequence, what we've got to do is we've got to figure out what would be the complementary RNA sequence that an RNA polymerase would make during transcription. So you're going to use basically Chargaff's rule, just like you did before, but instead of pairing up thymines across from adenines, you're going to put uracils across from adenines. I'll show you the first, like, let's say six um, letters, and then I'll pause and let you do the rest on your own. So let's choose a fun color here, maybe like an orange. So if we were an RNA polymerase and we were reading this strand starting from left to right, if we saw a thymine in the DNA, we would put an adenine across from it, right? Because A always pairs with T. If we saw an adenine, we would put a U across from it. Not a T because this isn't DNA, this is RNA. We'd put a U across from it. If we saw a C, we'd put a G across from it. If we saw an A, we'd put a U, etc. Hopefully you get the idea. I'm going to pause and stop talking for about five seconds. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video and try to write the rest of the sequence down and transcribe the complementary RNA sequence down as well. At the end of that five seconds, I'll show you the answer. Okay, I hope you pause the video and try to answer this on your own here is what you should have gotten. So again, go ahead and pause the video and make sure that this matches what you wrote down. All right, now you understand the process of RNA transcription, the first step in gene expression. So as a reward, here is a fantastic joke. Ugh, woof. Okay, so now we're on to part two. But before we talk about part two, let's talk about what's going to be responsible for part two. And that is the ribosome. So what we just did in transcription is we made an mRNA. Now what that mRNA is going to do is it's going to leave the nucleus where it was made and it's going to travel into the cytoplasm. And you can see it's kind of, it's leaving through a, a hole in the nucleus right here. Those holes are called nuclear pores, and they are big enough for mRNA to fit through, but they're not big enough for DNA to fit through, which is why there can be all these holes in the nucleus, but the DNA doesn't leak out. So the mRNA is going to leave through one of those pores, and it's going to float around in the cytoplasm until it finds something called a ribosome. A ribosome is a special molecular machine that is made of a bunch of protein as well as a little bit of 
rRNA. You might remember that in the lecture about the different types of RNA. So these purple and these orange components you can see here, those are all protein parts. And then this little yellow part is the um, rRNA component of the ribosome. And basically what these things do is they make proteins. But the way that they do that is they latch onto an mRNA strand and they travel along it and they read the message that it contains. And that gives them the instructions for how to make the protein. So this uh, kind of cavity right here that you see, that's where the mRNA is going to go. So these two parts will essentially clamp down on the mRNA that's in the middle here and read it. When they do that, the process that they are doing is called translation. So translation is making proteins. Transcription and translation are the two parts of gene expression or protein synthesis. So those sound really sim similar and it's it'll take a little while um, for you to keep them straight, but it is really important to keep transcription and translation straight and not get them mixed up. Let's talk about translation a little bit. And this is where things are going to look a little different than they did before because ribosomes kind of work in a different language than DNA or RNA would. Ribosomes speak the language of codons and amino acids. So when a ribosome is traveling along an mRNA strand. We're looking at kind of a, a zoomed in view of an mRNA strand here. And this is the sequence of nucleotides along that mRNA. When they read that mRNA, they don't read it one nucleotide at a time. They actually read it in sections of three, these chunks of three nucleotides called codons. And as they read those codons, each codon specifies an amino acid. So basically, as it's going along and it's reading each codon, it's reading the sequence of amino acids that it should use to make the protein. Now this code is, is universal and we at this point have figured out what the code is. So if you um, ever needed to know what, a, what the amino acid sequence would be for a particular mRNA strand, what you would use is you would use this re resource over here to the right which we call the translation wheel. This is, thing is gonna be your best friend. And I'm gonna show you how it works right now. So let's say that we wanna focus on this first codon, AUG, and we wanna know what amino acid does that codon code for? Well, what we would do is we would go to our translation wheel and start in the middle. And from the middle, we're gonna go first to the first letter in the codon we're interested in. So we're gonna go to A. We're working from the inside to the outside. So we're going to go from the middle to A. And then from there, now that we're in the A quadrant, we're going to go to the next letter, which is U. And then now that we're in that little U section, we're going to go to the last letter, which is G. And AUG codes for the amino acid methionine. That's how it works. So you could take an entire mRNA sequence break it up into codons and figure out what the sequence of amino acids that RNA sequence is coding for. And actually, that's what I'm gonna ask you to do in not too long. But first, I kinda of wanna talk about what a few other pieces of the puzzle here. So as you can see in this image, the ribosome is moving along an mRNA strand and it's reading it. And it's reading it in these three nucleotide chunks called codons. But here's the thing, the ribosome doesn't just have a stockpile of all the amino acids inside it. In fact, it doesn't have any amino acids like within the ribosome. It needs somebody else to deliver the amino acids that it's looking for when it needs them. So the ribosome has this system where it reads a codon and it kind of puts out a little flag and says, hey, I'm reading this codon, which means that I need this amino acid next. And there's this army of tRNA molecules in the cell. You might remember those from the RNA lecture as well. And each of those tRNAs has an amino acid that it's connected to. And so the ribosome calls out which amino acid it needs, and a tRNA that has that amino acid brings it to the ribosome and delivers it, and the ribosome takes it from the tRNA and adds it to 
the growing chain of amino acids that it's making. And eventually, I'm going to go back to that slide for a second. Eventually, it will have made a chain of all the amino acids that are in the protein. And then that amino acid chain will separate itself from this whole thing. And that amino acid chain becomes the protein that the ribosome just made. And we've gotten to the end of the process. But it's possible that you might have a couple of questions. First of all, how does the ribosome know where to start and stop? in the translation process. Well, it turns out there are chemical signals for that. In fact, there's a start codon that every single mRNA sequence starts with, and that is AUG, which is actually the one that we broke down just a second ago. So every single mRNA starts with AUG, and that's what tells the ribosome to start or it tells the ribosome where to start. So every single protein starts with a methionine amino acid, and there's also some stop codons. So every single mRNA is going to end with one of these three codons, either UAA, UAG, or UGA. And that will signal the ribosome where to stop. So ribosomes are very instruction driven. They basically attach to an mRNA, they look for the start codon, and then they trans translate all the codons until they get to a stop codon and then they stop. Now, something else you may have thought is that if codons are three nucleotides long and there are four different nucleotides, there's actually 64 different codons that are possible. So you might think there's 64 different amino acids, but there are not. There's only 20 amino acids. So those numbers don't add up. What's the deal? How do we have 64 codons and only 20 amino acids? Well, looking at this translation wheel, you can see that there are multiple codons for many of the amino acids. So for example, alanine here, the codons GCU, GCC, GCA, and GCG all code for the amino acid alanine. So there are in most respects, or, or for most amino acids, there are multiple codons that code for that amino acid, which means that every single one of the 64 codons does code for an amino acid, but there's only 20 amino acids. Now, here is your final exam. Not really, but just a practice implementing what we just covered. What I want you to do is I want you to take this mRNA sequence you see here in gray, split it up into codons, and then use the translation wheel to figure out what sequence of amino acids that RNA is coding for. I'm going to stop the video, or not stop the video, I'm going to stop talking for five seconds and let you do that. So pause the video now and see if you can answer this question. Did you pause the video? Did you try it on your own? I hope so, because I'm going to show you how to do it right now. So the first thing we're going to do is split this up into codons. Each of those three letter or three nucleotide sections is a codon, and each one codes for an amino acid. We're going to use the translation wheel to figure out which amino acid it's going to be. Well, AUG, as we have already established, codes for methionine, which I'm just going to abbreviate MET. GAC codes for aspartic acid, which I'm just going to abbreviate ASP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to keep doing that. And you should get that the sequence is methionine, aspartic acid, isoleucine, leucine, leucine, and then a stop codon. So as all proteins should, it starts with a start codon and ends with a stop codon. And there you have it. That's how translation works. So now you have gone through both steps of gene expression, aka protein synthesis. And you can actually manually figure out what the cell would do throughout that whole process. So as your grand finale reward, here is another top-notch science joke that you now understand.
Ugh. Was it worth it? Was it worth doing all that work for this joke? Do young people even say hipster anymore? I don't even know. Well, there you have it, everyone. We've talked about what codons are. We've talked about all the steps of the protein synthesis process. You now know all of the different molecules and organelles involved in protein synthesis. And you can take a DNA sequence, just like the one below. You can transcribe it into an RNA sequence and then translate it into a protein amino acid sequence using the translation wheel. And there you have it. That is section 5.6. I told you it was a doozy, but I know you're all up for it. So thanks for listening. Thanks for staying with me. And until next time, have a great day.